The Garden of Ink and Bones is a monthly podcast about witchcraft, powerful plants, and making magic. I'm Belle of Belladonna and Bones, and I'll be joined by occult artist Rue of Old Omen, and we're witches who like to get our hands dirty. To us, magic is practical, visceral, and bound in blood to the soil and bones of our spiritual allies. It's time to get your hands into the dirt, do the work, make magic, and feel the witchcraft in your bones. Welcome to the Garden of Ink and Bones. Welcome to episode four of The Garden of Ink and Bones. This week, Rue and I will recap on Michelle Jackson's Bones, Shells and Curios um, and working with Bella Donna over the last ooh, nearly eight weeks. Um, and also we will be talking about Saith, uh, The Gate is Open by Katie Gerard. Now that's actually spelled S-E-I-D-R and I had no idea that you said it like that um thanks Rue for being awesome um and we're gonna talk about fungi so uh wow how have you been Rue I've been really good this is um like I said this is definitely a topic I'm really excited about this episode but no life has been I don't know it just feels like the last week is completely blown by but I've been really good how have you been yeah I've been good too it's um it's a, like you said a hectic week um Managed to find us an editor, um, so I'll if, have to actually ask him if he has a website for us to put um, in links in the show notes. But uh, since he'll be editing this, he'll hear this and let me know. <laughs> um, so, guys, and so you know, it's great to have podcast editors. It saves um, a lot of us a lot of time and effort. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, we've been working with him, and we've been. Oh, just lots of stuff we've done been doing our second week of yoga yoga really hard still still really hard <laughs> not feeling any more flexible yet no <laughs> <laughs> no feeling worse I think every time you go you feel like you're like a little bit um you find a new place that you aren't flexible <laughs> and a new way that you don't have balance <laughs> It's like, I walk around every day I know how to balance I stand on two feet that's hard <laughs> Yeah, I've um, because I've been having a lot of the same issues with you that I've recently learned that I need to flap my arms more. Supposedly, is the term that I've been told. <laughs> flap your arms yeah. more mm, to loosen my high back. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great, great. Mm, yes, yeah. the, the problem with creative people, we always need our hands, and it's always what um is the most problems. Mm-hmm. So definitely. So um. So last month, or the last eight weeks, we've been working with Michelle Jackson's book. Um, I I know that the last while has been really hectic for us, so we're going to have to go back to the previous month where we actually did some work with it. I just kept looking at mine. <laughs> I really failed at actually trying to do a reading. And, and see, there's, this is what happens. We know that stuff gets in the way. Um but I just kept looking at my set and putting things in and out of it <laughs> and, and being that, you know, that collecting witch and just going, well, that's a nice idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and, and just getting in love with the idea of it and not actually doing any with, of it. But, Rue, you shared a um, a throwing that you put that we shared on the Instagram um, and a bit of your set. Do you want to tell us about that? I did, actually. Um, let me go back to it because, like you said, sorry about the dog scratching in the corner. Um, has been, like I said, an absolutely crazy time. So, yeah, my set, I wrote down it was on my Instagram on Old Omen, which I added a few extra things to it since we did do our last reading. So what I had changed and put into this one is I'll read out what was in that set for that reading was I included a bell, a white-faced heron beak, which was the lower jaw of it, a dried bat's foot, a hagstone, a kidna quill, rose hip, dried rose hip, bat bones from the wings, a coin, a buffalo horn carved crow, a key, a whole nutmeg, a wallaby jawbone, a seashell, a wallaby vertebrae, two of those, skull bead carved from bone, unknown species on that one. It's an old antique necklace that I'd found and a lace monitor claw. So a lot of those things, you know, I've, I have just hoarded over the years and sort of, you know, picked up in strange places. And a lot of those things that I use for other things as well, like the bat's foot that's been dried, I use 
outside of my bone reading. Um, but with that one as well, I didn't particularly do it for a casting reading in anything in particular. I just sort of did it as a setup to sort of show people how it was done. And if you go to my Instagram page, you can also see how I have a compass drawn up on a piece of cloth that I'll use for other spell work as well as sewing the bones. So you can dictate each quarter of the compass of what you want it to mean. Like things like in there, you can look, the key is facing towards the coin, which the coin in my case is either a male or a female, depending on which way it lands. The back foot next to it can often mean, um, say, spell work that's being traveled somewhere, you know, taking it through the flight of night or such. But yeah, it generally wasn't one for reading, but more of an example one. So sort of take it as you will. So what did you, what have you added to your set since then? I think at the time of our last recording, we I had about, I want to say it was around nine or 11 pieces. So I know that the heron beak had been added. Um, what else? What do you, what's, what's the heron beak um, symbolise? So I know, um, or at least personally, that the heron generally in symbology is sort of a director to the pathway of the underworld and reflection in yourself in the way that I view it. So often whenever I see herons around, it's sort of a, how do I word it a bit more eloquently, of um, the heron, heron is about self-reflection and looking at yourself in the spiritual side of it with that underworld passageway. Because I know that I've read a few years ago somewhere that it always sort of resonated that it does help transport souls to the underworld that they'll sort of lead them through the tunnel way. I get the feeling it was even from an old sort of Nordic book I'd written, which is sort of perfect of what we're talking about tonight. But it's a lot of, yeah, self-reflection in spirituality and what the sort of shadow self is doing and sort of looking at your flaws and how that sort of affects what you're currently doing, what you might not be aware of, what your subconscious is sort of playing on you, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So, yeah, and the big being communication, of course. Of course, of course. Um, guys, we're going to keep working with those bones. Um, I think it's one of those things that I, I've been – it's really hard to switch your mode of divination, um, you know, when you have one way that you divine most of the time. Um, trying others sometimes feels like cheating. Mm. Um <laughs> worry that you're going to break the other method or whatever um because i've been so heavily into scrying um and even my tarot practice has dropped off i feel like the yeah going back to this physical method um a will be useful but b it's really hard <laughs> you know so and that's exactly how i am with say tarot cards for example i find them so incredibly analytical and structured that I've never really been able to get them to work for me. Whereas mm. like Oracle decks make a bit more sense because they're a bit more, you know, take it as you will, which I think is why I like throwing the bones of you sort of make your own meaning. But I've never been able to really connect with tarot decks, even though I've got 40,000 of them sitting around that I keep <laughs> buying more pretty ones. They're pretty. <laughs> they're pretty. Collect the art. But, you know, I love tarot and I'm um, – I just don't find, like, I think like you said, I don't find it as, it doesn't take me as deep spiritually. Like um, I find it really useful. I, I, tarot is really useful for working with divination for others or when others are in the room for me. Mm. Um, like if, if I'm actually doing a reading for someone and they're sitting next to me, I would rather pull a tarot cup, yep. you know. Um, but if it's for myself... I will, my go-to is scrying in smoke. So, yeah. you know, that's um, that's just the way it is. So That's it. Everyone's got their own methods. That's right. And sometimes we just have to force ourselves to try something different. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we did have a few people um, share their uh, bone sets and things um, on Instagram, so I'm still reposting those. Um, so just pop by the... Um, Garden of Ink and Bones Instagram and um, have a look at those. Yeah, definitely. So on to Belladonna. Um, 
it's hard. I don't ever think I really stop working with Belladonna. <laughs> so, you know, while I don't use it physically, it's it's still always there. And, and at the moment it's just about to get broken up. This Hopefully this weekend I'll be able to sit down with the plants and actually um, do some root cuttings um, now that all the leaves have died off and everything. I uh, have the most amazing collection of berries this year, so, you know, I might... It's hard to grow them from seed, so I do prefer to just keep the berries to use in different um, things. And they are wonderful in smudge sticks, like just wrapping a berry in the middle of the smudge stick and going nuts. Mm. Um, I haven't had much of a chance to work with it, but I've noticed that at the moment it's just appearing absolutely everywhere in the last month, even though I felt too busy to do anything. I feel like every time I turn around, it's sitting somewhere in someone's garden or it's appearing in my own, especially the Nigeria. Nigra? Nigra? The yeah, Nigra. Nigra. Yeah, so it's it's definitely prodding at me. I just haven't had time. <laughs> yeah, I've been, I have this giant Nigra bush in the back of um, the yard and I've kind of been toying with trying to get a fibre out of it um, like you do with nettles and um, and thistles and things like that where you can use the inner bark to make a fibre. Um, so I wanted to see whether I could do something similar with the Negra because it's got, it's, when I say it's a bush, it's nearly as tall as I am. Um, it's just one of those ones that's been there for, well, has to be two or three years now and just keeps growing. Um, mm. just has, it's in the perfect spot. It, it's growing out of our compost pile. <laughs> I'll be really clear. <laughs> you know, it is the healthiest, um, thing in the garden. Yeah, um, they go nuts. The moment they sort of work their way in there, there's no way of getting rid of them. Yeah, and I don't mind that because of where it is. So, um, yeah, and I think this one of the things is, is it is really easy to, rest, especially for me, to restrict myself to um, just to, just a trope of belladonna. Um, but remembering that there are all these other nightshades out there um, that you can work with um, in different ways and, and just remembering that, Everything you work with doesn't have to be um, ingested, smoked, um, put on your skin or something like that. It can be worked with in, you know, you can use the leaves to write charms on. You can take the bark and turn it into a fibre. You can um, use the stems to build yourself um, protection uh, cages or spirit cages and things like that. Um, yeah, it doesn't have to be working with a plant doesn't mean that it has to have a, a psychoactive hmm. um, ability. So Yeah, that reminds me of um, I know one that's often used with divination is the bay laurel leaves of people throwing them into the fire and seeing how they burn sort of denotes what sort of effect you'd be getting from your reading. And so it's another sort of way of looking at it of, yeah, you don't have to ingest something. But interestingly enough, um, if you read, there's a book on the Oracle of Delphi and it's a, um academic text on, you know, what different writings are around. And it said that there was a tea made from seven um, bay leaves that, that she may have drunk, you know, in one account that the, the Oracle of Delphi drank. Um, and I've tried making a tea from seven fresh bay leaves, I will stress that, because seven dried bay leaves really strong for some they get way stronger when you dry them um so yeah and it was delicious and quite not altering I wouldn't have called it altering but definitely I felt like my um reading that I did after it was clearer um in its own way so so that's an interesting aside yeah one of those other methods so but actually um Sorry, I was going to say, actually, um, it's another good tie-in to what we're going to talk about this week with fungi because saying that not everything has to be ingested um, because there's so many things that we can talk about with fungi and, you know, in most cases you have to be pretty damn careful about what you ingest. Yeah, definitely. Which, um, So what are we talking about this week, Belle? So we're going to talk about um, it's Amanita season. Um, for the southern hemisphere um, and if you're in certain parts of the northern hemisphere you're probably getting a second flush I know we do um, 
a little bit towards the end of the uh, end of spring, beginning of summer. Sometimes there's a second flush depending on how wet the spring has been. Um, but down here we're collecting our first amanitas. Um, if if you're doing if you would do that in a place where it's legal, um, you'd be collecting amanitas. Um, and also noticing them around and, and having them in areas where you might find yourself in a fairy ring um, of different mushrooms and how you work with those fungi. Now, Rue, I know that the fungi are a special interest area of yours, so why don't you give us a little background on using them in magic? Mm, definitely. So this is definitely one of those topics that I'm hugely, hugely passionate about. For years I've grown a lot of medicinal mushrooms myself and always gone out and sort of wild harvested them. So a few interesting things about fungi in general that I sort of like to talk about before we even delve into the Amanita muscaria is the fact that one, which is just an awesome little topic, is that they breathe oxygen. So they are not like plants which breathe carbon dioxide of they consume oxygen just like us. They also form networks in forests that allow different plants to communicate with each other. So trees have found and done studies and wondering if it's getting attacked by, say, a certain bug or having something done to it, it'll release um, certain stressed hormones which will actually travel through the mycelium network and communicate with other trees. And they've found that the other trees will sort of almost change to try and deal with those sorts of things so the fungi in general fungi is actually the fruit of what is the mycelium so the mycelium when you dig into the earth you'll find these like almost a white spider web sort of thing that's the actual body of the fungus the fungi itself is actually just the fruits like the fruits of a tree so yeah. absolutely fascinating like if you want to go into say medicinal as well they're just so many things that I think that we can definitely deal with with mushrooms in general. If you have any interest in this topic, I'd definitely look into, say, Paul Stemmett's research into it. He has a few amazing TED Talks like Six Ways Fungi Can Save the World. Um, he's looked into – we've got a few Australian natives here. Because, because it, fungi is a living organism, you'll find pharmaceutical companies can't really – patent living organism so there's not a huge amount of research done in the mycology sort of sector but we have found things like the lion's mane mushroom be able to actually create new neural pathways in damaged brains which is bringing people's families back from alzheimer's and dementia completely um mm -hmm. we found their local turkey tail mushroom that you'll find all through the Australian bushland is amazing for your immune system. And so people going through chemotherapy, like Paul Stemmett's mother, who was given, I think, four months to live, was taking this turkey tail mushroom and she is still here seven years later. So there's so many amazing benefits when it comes to fungi in general, let alone the psychoactive ones that, you know, we tend to find in our forests. So definitely an amazing topic, which I could prattle on about for hours. But Emanita muscaria is definitely got its own amazing history and it's definitely one of those ones that I'm sure everyone knows about. So everyone knows what an Emanita muscaria looks like, whether you know the name or not. It's the little red capped mushroom with the white spots on it. It's mm -hmm. other folk names are the fly agaric, which a lot of people now, there's this huge misconception that I found in, um, Oh, I've gone blank on his name, that really famous guy that wrote that herbology book that everyone uses, the really basic one. Cunningham? Cunningham, yeah. What is it? Cunningham's Encyclopedia of... Encyclopedia of Herbs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So in Cunningham's Encyclopedia of Herbs, he actually notes that the Emanita muscarius, other folk name is the death cap, which is something that really irritates me because... I've found that it's a huge misconception that I find everywhere of everybody states Emanita as the death cap, whereas Emanita phalloid is actually the death cap, which does often cause fatalities. So your yeah, Emanita muscaria, although you can die from it, it, I think the average overdose rate last I checked is like 20 good sized caps, but still don't experiment with that number, please. <laughs> and, and let's also be clear that um, an un an untreated 
um, Amanita, so it has to be dyed at a certain heat, uh, dried at a certain heat, um, will make you vomit violently. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, and also, and look, it's actually one of the easiest ones to identify. <laughs> that's it. So you shouldn't get it wrong. And funnily enough as well that um, for Amanita poisoning, one of the antidotes for it is actually belladonna, ironically enough. So tying back into our last episode. But, yeah, so Amanita mascara. And also the other way around. It, it's so if you, ironic, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's this weird symbiotic relationship. Oh, um, 100%. So, yeah, Emily Muscaria has two different compounds in it, your ibotenic acid and your mucimol. But like you said before, Belle, um, it's actually got a toxic compound that unless you heat it or dry it to a certain level to remove, it can cause, it can cause vomiting, diarrhea. It can also cause long-term liver damage as well. So it is one that if you're going to experiment with, which is completely up to you, we're not advising it. It is something that you need to really understand how to work with this mushroom. And, of course, check your uh, state and national laws around whether it's legal to harvest. Um, and, yeah, so it's usually possession a possession um, issue. Um, you know, it's illegal to harvest. So mm, exactly. you, you won't be able to grow it yourself. Uh, it's another thing about Amanita is it's incredibly picky about where it grows. Um, most mushroom people, what do they call themselves, mycologists? Mycologists. Um, yeah, they can't, they haven't found a way to get it to grow in controlled yeah. um, places. It just doesn't, it, its spores won't spore unless it has some kind of fungi and then even then it will only do it in a certain areas. So. Yeah, it needs a – it is one of those interesting mushrooms that relies on a symbiotic relationship with a tree. So generally they are found in pine forests because they need the pines to actually be able to grow. But they've recently started discovering in the past few years only that the Emanita muscarias in Australia have begun to actually evolve and they're starting to find they've begun to build that – relationship with the native eucalypts which has actually been a massive problem because it's actually now starting to take over from a lot of our native fungi since it is an introduced species and it's actually wreaking a lot of havoc on our native ecosystem unfortunately as beautiful and as much as i love it it has now sort of become to start to become a bit of a pest yeah yeah of course um and that's the that's the issue with um, all of these things is, you know, sometimes, like, it's the same with lion's mane. You can't actually bring – I know that I was talking to a guy last year about lion's mane mushrooms. Um, I was looking into them for pain for um, fibromyalgia um, and they – the guy had them and he'd gotten a, he got he messaged me like a week later saying yeah i've got them they're nearly ready and he said no look they've all been i've been told to destroy them all by border security um so yeah it's an interesting one that um the, that is sometimes you know we have to be considerate of our own environment and um and not seek out some of these species um, and if we are going to grow them, grow them very carefully um, with a, whatever they are. Yeah, There's that's... a bit of discussion along, you know, lots of different online groups and people go, oh, that's a weed and it's bad. And it's like, well, yes, but I keep it in a pot um, and I cut off all the flowers and all the um, anything that might cause it to spread. So, you know, mm. sorry, monkeys ringing his bell again for everyone, but just wanted everyone to know he was here. <laughs> Damn cat. Yeah, it's um that's all the shame is I think a lot of that the plants that we do discuss and work with on this show are generally introduced species. So it's just yeah, like you said, one of those things to be careful about and be aware about, especially if you're in, you know, areas like Tasmania or Western Australia where you do have those tougher sort of securities. Yeah, and I do want to do a a, a future episode on um dying plants that you die with Mm. um i'm just thinking about um natives and eucalyptus um and how you might work with plants you die with rather than just 
focusing on a specific plant, but we'll come back to that in a couple of episodes, I promise, guys. <laughs> um, but in terms of... Um, in terms of Amanita, um, the the spirit itself is so big. Um, in my experience, like it's such a it's such a big presence, and get a lot of questions about how to work with it when it doesn't grow in your area. Um, and I kind of feel like sometimes, you know, well, I always say, you know, if you can grab a dried specimen. Um, to put on your altar that's awesome um but one of the other ways is that it, it's such a prevalent spirit in fairy tales and children's artwork and um and just art fantasy art in general that I just feel like it's it's less difficult to connect with than you might think because it's everywhere Mm, it's ironically sort of become the mushroom through history that's been primarily worshipped, I think, is definitely one of those easier spirits to connect with. Yeah, and, and even just not not so much worshipped, but it's just it's when you say draw a mushroom to most people, <laughs> that's they will they draw, draw it, colour it red and put white spots on it. Mm, it's everywhere. Yeah. And, you know, there's argument that it has as well inspired the idea of Santa Claus and a bunch of other stuff through our folklore and history. There's so many strange connections to this mushroom. So it's sort of everywhere that you turn. I mean, like I said, everybody knows what it looks like, whether you know its name or not. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, I think um, for a, that's my first piece of advice for people is just um, – remember that you can connect you're probably already connected to this mushroom because in your head it's probably what you think of when you think of a mushroom um you know it might be different in eastern cultures um but yeah i think uh in western culture and in you especially in european cultures um maybe stress less and and just sort of reach out to it um now one of the other great things is so many great stories about Amanitas, you know, from um, northern Siberian tribesmen who feed the Amanitas to the deers and then drink the deer pee so that um, they don't get the um, – it, it's the ebotenic acid, I think, that causes the vomiting. Um, correct me if I'm wrong there. But, um, yeah, those – who thinks to drink a deer's pee? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, the, what was going through the, that person's mind? Exactly. And there's also, I think, the um, Siberian shamans as well because it was um, sort of a bit more valuable there in those really northern parts where they couldn't get it as much. It was the top shaman got to consume it first and then everyone below them because it doesn't actually the psychoactive compound does not break down in your body it's still just as potent in your urine it then went down to the next guy and then the guy under him went to the next guy and it's just like yeah it's one of those things that <laughs> you've got to be game yeah yeah Hey, uh, just want to mention, guys, if you, you're getting a bit of background noise, sorry, tonight we're just, we've had some recording issues and um, so we're both in places where not necessarily um, that are ideal for recording, so we are sorry about the background noises. <laughs> yeah, you're probably hearing a small puppy running around madly. <laughs> and the cat keeps getting up and down and, yeah, it's just a, it's just one of those things. So, so what books would you recommend people would read um, if they want to read about um, Amanitas and other mushrooms, aside from TED Talks? So one of my favourite ones in general is simply A Field Guide to Australian Fungi is really, really awesome by Bruce Fuhrer. I, I feel like I take it with me everywhere. It's one of those books that if I sort of had to run out of the house, I'd probably be grabbing it first. But one of my other all-time favourites is Toads and Toadstools by Adrian Morgan, which is really, really fascinating. It goes through a lot of different of the different mushrooms and chemical compounds as well as toads like the bufo toad and such. And it's 
absolutely fascinating. And of course, on the front cover is a toad sitting on top of an Amanita muscaria. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that is a really cute, um, cute uh, cover on that one. Mm. But yeah, but it's one. It's one of those ones that's just it's everywhere and like we're discussing tonight of we're talking about Saith, um, which is a Nordic tradition. Emanita is so prevalent in Nordic history for thousands and thousands of years. You know, the term berserker is actually formed because of the Emanita muscaria. It is, unlike a lot of other psychoactive mushrooms, a lot more um, inconsistent in its results. You yes. can have sort of a really drunken sort of feeling effect or you can have what was termed the berserker rage. So a lot of the Vikings before going into battle would consume the Emanita to get this berserker rage behind them to give them that energy to go and fight and that's what actually termed the term berserker was their consuming of the Emanitas. Like it's just so prevalent everywhere you look through history. Yeah, Um and I think so. I want to talk about um, the different reactions, but I want to I want to stick on the berserker for a second. But um, one of the things is um, the endurance it can give. Um, and there's a there's a great story um, about the Koryak tribe, um, and they say the story is the origins of the muscaria. Um, do I keep calling it Mysteria? That's my own fault because I have a balm that's made from it that's Mysteria, but Muscaria. <laughs> um, it says, Big Raven one day found himself unable to carry a heavy burden of much-needed provisions for his tribe. He called upon Vahian to give him strength and was told to seek out the Wapak spirits who would give him the strength he needed. Big Raven followed Vahian and at the proper place Vahian spat upon the ground and where his saliva fell there sprung red-hatted plants still dappled with the white of the god's saliva. Upon consuming these plants Big Raven found himself filled with strength and stamina. So that's that um, berserker rage but also the endurance that it can give um, and I found it really useful at the beginning of uh, a long night of ritual um, to burn it as, as an incense. Um, it doesn't smell nice, but <laughs> it does. It does work really well. And the other thing that happens is when you are drying them, they take, you know, they're, they're supposed to be dried for six to seven hours at 65 to 75 degrees Celsius. Um, with all of these sort of things, you should always check Erowid, E-R-O-W-I-D dot com, um, anything there's lots of really interesting stuff to read there about preparation of um different types of hallucinogenics legal and illegal um and also people's experiences and other interactions and when they've taken them with other drugs and when they haven't or alcohol really really important that if you are planning to do any experimentation you you read things like that but i found that when i'm drying them in the house um depending on the age that they take can take nearly, you know, up to 24 to, you know, 28 hours to de- um, to dry mm, down to They level. are really, really, really fleshy and have yeah. a lot of moisture in them. Yeah, and they rot. Like you'll only ever make the mistake once of not drying them um, <laughs> because if it's if, – unless you end up with a really dry, hot couple of weeks – after you pick them, and I say really dry and hot, um, they will rot and they turn to liquid that sticks. But the the even the drying process I find causes sleepless nights in my house. Um, yeah. So just that the aroma that's given off and the and the way the spirit fills the house um, often leads to massive amounts of um, productivity. Um, whether it's creative or um, just work that happens and also just really, yeah, days that start at six and don't finish till two in the morning um, because you're just so full of energy Um, and that's just from drying them out, you know, no contact. And I find, yeah, that that scent that you mentioned because I normally use a dehydrator on a really low level 
it's intoxicating. You can't get that scent out of the house, I find. Even after you've packed them up, it just sort of lingers and completely fills everything. But then as well, like we were saying, they are just so variable of then you'll find you'll consume them and sometimes it's a drunken stupor that will completely almost make you just fall asleep and go into a really, really heavy deep sleep. So they are you can have them and have completely different reactions. It's one of those really strange ones. You never know what it's going to do. Yeah, and I, just with anything, you know, whether you're using a balm or an incense or um, or taking them internally or whatever, um, it's always just important to start small um, and titrate your dose um, so that you, you know, you start small and you work up because you don't know how you're going to react and people can have really bad trips on um, Amanitas. It can be quite dark um, depending on what it thinks you need. Um, so, yeah, really, um, yeah, really take your time with it. Don't don't rush. And it's definitely one of those ones that I would advise that you do have somebody more experienced trips at you if you are going to experiment with this mushroom. Yep. It's better than sort of going in blind by yourself and, like you said, having a bad trip and who knows what's going to happen. Yeah. Always have someone with you. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that the person has to be involved in your ritual, but, um, you know, the, the person, especially you don't really want them involved. You want them to sit there and just make sure you're all right and, and be sober. You're supposed to, you know, they're your designated driver, your sober companion. Um, exactly. You know? Um, and actually, ironically, ironically, no, that's just the bad use of the word, ironically, um, it does link into what we're going to talk about um, with the book Safe is, you know, we're talking about, we're going to talk about safety in ritual and things like that, but also just having someone to pull you out of a trance, whether it's induced or non-chemically induced, um, it's still useful to have someone to be there to help you stop going wherever you're going hmm, exactly so um f- actually for you is do you think that um it's the spirit of fungi in general um that you work with or more or do you work with a muscaria um specifically i'd say it's a fungi in general um I do find it was the one plant that back when I, it was also one of the first things I began experimenting with years and years ago. And it's one of those ones that I always come back to, but it was also, I feel one of the first uh, things that I worked with that made its spirit really prevalent and made me sort of realize that it was heavily a conscious being. But with all the different fungi I have experimented with, I do feel content in saying that, they all do have different spirits for different strains. They are all very different and they're all very strong in their presence as well. So I'd say it's the fungi in general that I do work with. Um, Amanita muscari is actually probably one of the lesser ones that I do work with as much as I do absolutely love it and enjoy working with it, but it's definitely not the main one that I do work with. Yep. So... What barriers do you think people will find working with fungi? I find that a lot of the times it will, from experience from myself and from a lot of working with other people and walking (coughs) through with them, it brings up a lot of things that have happened in your past. Mm. So it can become really confronting. And if you have had trauma there, I find fungus in general, it's like, it suddenly brings something up from 20 years ago that you hadn't even thought about. And trips can be intense and grueling and it will bring up all these traumas that you have gone through and make you almost sort of relive them and dig through them, which I think scares a lot of people off. And I've always found personally it's the healthiest way to heal in my eyes because then the next day when you've gone through it and you're over it, I find even though it's brought it all up, to put the puzzle pieces back together of anything that has been broken, I've found it's definitely, I can say in my life, definitely healed me more than any other plant. And 
we're finding, especially now, so that in the UK especially, they've just re- uh, lifted a 40-year ban on psychologists working with um, psilocybin mushrooms because they find that it does amazing wonders for people with depression, with anxiety, and for people with post-traumatic stress disorder, they're finding these things are actually working better than any pharmaceuticals that they've tried in the past. But that is to say that there needs to be the correct set and setting. There needs to be someone there that knows sort of how to handle these situations because I have also seen people delve into this and it has turned out bad because they haven't known how to deal with what it can bring up. Yeah. So, yeah, it's in my eyes fungi can be quite confronting but that's sort of what I like about it. Yep, I think that's exactly right. So our book this month is Safe, and that's S-E-I-D-R, The Gate is Open by Katie Girard, um, and it's working with Trance, Prophecy, The High Seat, and Norse Witchcraft. Um, might seem like a kind of specific type of book for us, um, but I think it's one of those books where there is so much good um advice and magical technology inside it that um if you're not even if you're not interested in Norse witchcraft which I certainly wasn't and am not um ongoing there's there's still a lot um a lot you can get out of this book Mm, definitely like it was one of the first books I sort of really resonated with when I sort of got back into witchcraft many years ago when I was sort of trying to figure out where I was going and I went through sort of a bit of a Nordic phase because I've always found the Edis quite fascinating but even though it's not something I really work with now but I really liked Katie Gerrard's work because I find that everything that she does apply in this book is still applicable like her trans work in general, you know, you don't need one specific work, one specific path to be working with trans work and get such amazingly profound effects mm-hmm. out of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's it. And also um, she comes at it from a very uh, academic background. Um, so the, the book is very questioning um, and talks about the source materials and tries to encourage you to question your interpretation and and others interpretation of source materials um whether they're you know ancient or modern you know so i think that's really important yeah it's definitely i think kind of refreshing in this field at times because i know i think we sort of just accept a lot of things and don't really question it and sometimes we do need to question it and something like you said before that i did like about her work is she talks about Um, especially with trans work of things like protection and thinking about these things that, you know, sometimes people don't mention that I do feel is actually quite important. Just like trip sitting, it's good to have that person there to be able to sort of pull you out of something if something is going wrong. The same with trans work because I have found that when I've experimented, especially with, say, drumming work in the past, you can get, get just as potent effects from drumming and from trance work that you can from a psychoactive experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also on that, one of the things, it, you know what, if, if people picked this book up and just read the introduction, they would get more out of it than they would out of a lot of other books on trance work. <laughs> um, it's kind of a funny book like that. Um you know, she talks about the different ways that you can move the consciousness into an altered state. She starts with drumming, dancing, chanting, music, repetition, exhaustion, relaxation, incense, and I would put that under, and plus other psychoactives, um, swaying, pain, and sensory deprivation. Now, you know, all of those are useful. You just have to find the one that fits. Some people cannot do meditation like they just cannot sit there um and switch off their mind enough to get into a trance and that's the commonest um reason that people look for a a a chemical alternative to getting into trances is because they say they can't switch off their mind enough um but sometimes you ask them have you 
you gone for a run? <laughs> have you have you tired yourself out so much that you cannot physically do anything else and you cannot mentally um, think of anything else, you know? Have you worked yourself in, ever worked yourself into a state by dancing, you know? Have you ever been to a rave and just lost yourself in the music? Have you drummed? Have you been around someone else who's drumming until it, until the music hits you, um, you know, so deep within yourself that it, you actually vibrate, you know? Have you tried a flotation tank? I can't. They're freaky freaking things. I don't understand how anyone gets in one of those. <laughs> um, but just think about how, and I want to be, you know, really raise a flag on pain. Um, I think one of the things with pain is it needs to be in a controlled setting with a partner. And I think it comes down to a safe setting. Um, I don't think cutting yourself is a useful way to attain trance. Don't use trance as an excuse to cut yourself. <laughs> um, those are really bad people. Don't do that because um, you're, you're just hiding one massive um, issue with another. Um, but you could look at if you um, have a partner who's experienced in rope bondage, not that I do, thank goodness, um, or inexperienced, which I don't either, um, Hang on, that made no sense at all. Just edit that whole thing out um, in my brain. I pretend I never said that. Um, but, you know, <laughs> if you're into different types of bondage or other things that cause pain in a consenting and adult relationship, you may look at those um, as a safe way to experience pain. Um, you know, different religious orders throughout the years have experienced pain it, even the Catholics do the whole flogging thing that's, you know, the Gardener and Wiccans do as well. Um, that's exactly what I was thinking. There's self-flagellation and you'd see these monks that have just destroyed their backs yeah. by shredding pieces off themselves to attain that that state. Yeah, sounds really stupid to me. Um, my, recommendation, <laughs> my recommendation there is don't. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> don't do anything that physically hurts yourself. Um, you know, but each to their own. Um, so, yeah, just remember that lots of different things can make you achieve, uh, achieve trance. Actually, when I was in um, Singapore talking to Kat Borealis, she was talking about how um, she's a scientist, right, and, and how in one of her experiences of science um, involves a giant speaker and... Um, and wavelengths that the human mind can't hear um, but are coming off natural phenomena and how the the actual sound, which she couldn't even hear, was making her feel physically unwell. Um, and I was just thinking about how when you're sometimes at a, um, a dance party or a concert or something and you're near the speakers so much, you can't hear the vibration but it's affecting you Um as much or if not more than the music itself is. Mm, yeah, infrasound is one of those amazingly weird things. Yeah, they've found even certain frequencies, you know, can make you throw up or, you know, there's the whole brown note of making people soil themselves. But I know also they found out, I think it was only probably about 10 years ago, They, for years and years they didn't think that giraffes actually verbally communicated till they found out that they were actually communicating through infrasound, which humans can't detect, and also whales as well no use these different frequencies. But it's, yeah, there's all these amazing things that can affect us that we often can't even hear or understand. And then, you know, you go into, I know my partner's actually spoken in the past about experimenting with sound healing and using certain frequencies, and he found that, and he is, seems like quite a sceptical person have said that he did feel it had an effect on him. So it, there's so many different ways to experiment with these things that we can't even detect. Yeah, and there's all those, um, those different frequencies. Um, if you go on YouTube, there's lots of different um, mind wave frequencies that they, they say can get you into trance. I haven't tried them, but I've definitely tried the shamanic drumming um, ones on YouTube and some of those are fantastic because I have the rhythm of a 
um, pogo stick without a spring. So (laughs) I am never doing the drumming. Um, I have to find someone talented like yourself or um, someone on YouTube who has some exceptional uh, drumming skills to put me under if I'm going to use drumming. Mm, And I I will note with drumming, if you do want to experiment with it, um, it does have to be a certain beat to try and get you into that trance from memory from off the top of my head it's four beats per second is what will sort of get you into that so but yeah you can find amazing ones on youtube as well that you can sort of i find noise cancelling headphones are the best to sort of really take yourself into it but there are some absolutely profound and amazing things that can be done with it yeah and, and even those um even the simple experience of noise cancelling headphones with the sensory deprivation um, can be quite effective um, in and of themselves. I don't know whether anyone's ever gotten on a plane and put on some serious noise cancelling headphones and just gone, that's freaky. <laughs> like that is a scary, scary situation in terms of just the, the lack of sound is actually a lot of sound in your mind. Yeah, it's funny that it's... um. It's almost deafening at times if you've really experienced true sound deprivation. It's it's bizarre. It kind of actually freaks me out. Yeah. Yeah. Being claustrophobic, definitely all of that stuff freaks me out. <laughs> um, so one of the things uh, Katie talks about very seriously is, um, is protection. Um, she says, before you start, the last part of this introduction could easily be called the boring bit. Uh, the ideas and rights in this book are not suitable for complete beginners. Um, this is not to say that you cannot include a complete beginner in one of those rights, nor is it to say that I insist everyone attending my own rights have intermediate and advanced skills and trance journeying and channeling. However, if you are working alone in a group or in a group that does not have any experienced members, you should ultimately seek to gain more experience in trance and journeying techniques before you attempt anything pr- practical from the following pages. Wow, that sounds like a, well, if you haven't done this before, don't read this book. That's not actually true. <laughs> There's so much useful stuff in this book. Um, you know, but I do think I do think she's right. Look, mainly I think she's right because she really does talk about working with some pretty heavy hitters in the spirit world um, and, and some pretty heavy hitting gods, um, which I would never presume to work with. Um, being not of that tradition and I know that tradition's become really really popular since hmm, Thor came out um, and people think Loki is sexy Um, which yeah yeah, remember that's hair dye people otherwise he's just another ginger Um, (laughs) and you know and yeah it's just Think about why you're interested in it. Um, you know, I know also in America there's a strong uh, division in the, the community um, based around a lot of people in the, the neo-Nazi tradition co-opting uh, heathenism um, as a, a white, white supremacy kind of religion, um, which is really, really gross. So don't. Um, if that's your motives for getting into it, don't (laughs) um but yeah again heavy hitters in the spirit world so maybe um if you're thinking about getting into this book because you think um you know hanging out with loki and thor is trendy um think again uh really 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 check yourself yeah definitely um forming a relationship is probably the best way to sort of start working about it and um, for those interested as well, there is another heathenry path that if you find Seath interesting could also be something of interest for people it is Ausatru. So it is spelled A-S-A-T-R-U, which is working with the Germanic gods and goddesses. Yeah. So it's sort of, yeah, if you are interested in this, definitely yeah, do your research, but I wouldn't just delve into it and expect, you know, gratification yeah and i think a lot of it um was the the really trendy or no the really appealing aspect of being a god wife um which was incredibly um prevalent on 
on Tumblr and all of those sort of social media sites um, around for people to say that they were married to Loki um, and and that sort of thing. And it's like, well, I'm not sure I'd want to do that. You know, he was a donkey at one point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, just and uh, just check your check the groups that you're considering being affiliated with because, yeah, again, some of that German heathenry um, has some some very questionable branches um, that you'll want to look at. And, yeah, ease your way into it. Find out whether it's actually for you before you uh, jump in. But saying that, there is so much use, so many useful things in this book. Um, she talks in depth about protection setting up your space, keeping order in your space, um, and then has this excellent section on psychic first aid. It's really important when you're um, doing trance and possession rites um, to have a, a spotter again um, because sometimes, you know, you will have people who go too deep into the rite and can't come out, um, you know, perhaps get taken over by spirits that they didn't intend to contact. Um, sometimes, well, it'll be a little controversial here, Some pe- sometimes people play it up for the sake of playing it up. Um, like they think that they can't, sometimes they can't um, achieve it and they go full exorcist um, to try and freak other people out or to pro- try and pretend that they've actually... Um, achieved the trance that they were trying for and um, they actually can cause really poor experiences for other people so um, knowing when to pull a person out um, whether that whether what they're going through is real or not real you, you probably can't make a judgment call but if it's if it's causing other participants to really um, be disturbed or lose their shit then it might be time to end the ritual. Mm, definitely. And, I mean, going back to protection as well, I mean, like any other kind of form of witchcraft in general, I mean, your basic protection is, say, your circle. So even just stuff like that as well to have with you. But I know I heard about... Um, it was in some historical thing I was reading can't remember where it was it was years ago now but they'd mentioned that there there was one particular person doing trance work to try and contact one particular spirit that was quite hostile and they'd have at least two other people standing over the person while they went into the trance and having certain objects around them like I think they had like a silver sword or something like that and they'd have those people to be able to drag them out of it if it did go too deep so it's it's like anything else of you're essentially sort of opening yourself up to everything and leaving your body and going into something else's home. So you don't really know what you're going to experience. It's worth having some form of protection. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, when you go do this, what sort of protections do you like to have around? Um, I like to, it depends on, I guess, where I'm going or what I'm trying to connect with. Often I'll have things like a piece of iron around because, as we all know, iron is one of those typical protective items. I always have silver on me as well. It's just one of those other ones. I like to set up a circle. I like to have different wards and just basic things so that not only am I protected as I travel but also the your body is protected as well because, I mean, if you've got no inhabitant, well, who says something else won't come join you? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really important as well. Um, and I think one of the other things is asking your familiar spirits um, and your guardian spirits and, you know, either your ancestors or, for me, plant spirits um, to be there to be with you for protection. Um, Definitely. You know, that's, that's really important. And it should be your first, um, one of your first points of call. Actually, I, I do agree with you. I think your circle should be your first point of call if you're not in your especially if you are for some reason not in your own sacred space um, that you use all the time. Um, One of the herbs that you might look at for psychic protection is marshmallow. Um, Altheas are very useful for 
guiding or smoothing the way through um, through the psychic world. Like um, they're they're mucilaginous, um, so they they're sticky and um, they can help you slide through things and help things slide off you as well. Um, yeah, and also um, because they have that um, slimy nature, they they prov- um, provide like a protective barrier um, for your psyche as well, um, which I quite like when you go into trance. Um, so she talks about bringing people out of trance um, and, you know, doing it gently um, if they need to be brought out. Um, some people can bring themselves out quite easily. Like I, well, what I tend to do is use some sort of timer um, with a gentle um, waking thing. So something that like will I have a couple of recordings where it's just a bell that starts to sound really, really softly um, and then it gets louder and louder and louder until I come out of the trance. Um, that's really useful as well. Um, sometimes drum recordings will, I think they slow down um, and they'll change tempo to bring you out of the trance, um, all those sort of things. Um, do you prefer to use other people to bring you out of the trance or how do you bring yourself out of trance? Um, I tend to like to do it when I'm completely alone. I don't really feel comfortable working in front of other people. Um, I generally, I'll have, like you said, a timer is always really good or a word that I will sort of ingrain into myself before I go into it and I'll try and use that word to sort of snap me out of it while I am there if I do need to or I, a really, really good method that I learnt actually from Lee Morgan. I did a workshop with her a few years back. Um, she set up a really great way of going into trance where you'll set up an entry point in the real world and you'll walk that path physically. So then when you start drumming, you'll walk that same path again and enter it. And then so when you want to return, you'll take those steps back from the way that you came sort of you know following that string back that I found worked really quite well yeah actually that's um that's one of the rituals that uh Katie has it's the waking the spirits right and she actually talks about using a physical um gateway to go through um which gives you that that in and out of the ritual and in and out of the spirit space um which is really useful. And I think that's what I want people to take away from this book is the technology and the methods and the, the ritual format. Um, you know, there's a high seat right to Asgard, which, well, I'll never do that ritual, but as a ritual format um, and some of the technology that's in it, it's, it's really useful you should look at it and go, okay, how do I relate this to how I work um, and go from there? Yeah, exactly. Just taking that template is, I don't know, I think everything that she sort of writes about is versatile if you want to sort of change it in your own way, which is why I still, even though I don't follow this path, I find it so useful in everything that I still do do. And as well for anyone else that is starting out on this, another good thing to sort of use is the internet youtube ironically it has some really good guided um trance works you can find that'll sort of also help pull you out because you have someone there sort of directing you yep yep absolutely that's a a good point i've actually recorded my own guided medication meditations that people can grab off the website um i totally forgot to talk about them um (laughs) but i think this what we want you to look at with this book this month it's not necessarily the book specifically we want you to think about your trance um experience and how and what you can do to either deepen your trance experience um without the use of psychoactives i think that's the the clear thing i'd like to see people try to look at what they can do to increase the experience they have when they're within trance 
Um, and yeah, think about how you prepare to do trance work, whether you bathe ritually, whether you um, how try a different way to get into it. So try exhausting yourself and going for a run or try dancing or try drumming if you normally just sit and meditate. Um, and if you need to exhaust yourself, then maybe try normally, then maybe try a bit of sensory deprivation if you're not claustrophobic. Um, you know, try the opposite and see what effect you have. Um, it has on you. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I find one of the strongest methods that works for me is walking in a spiral and just constantly doing that. It really sort of zones you out after a while and I've had it do incredibly profound effects, especially in the past two working with fire, since I do like to work with a lot of fire, walking circles around it and feeding it really gets you deep into it and think about what herbs you're putting into it, what smoke you're consuming and all those sorts of things. That's a great point. I've had, like I said before, I've had incredibly potent results from trance work as much as I have from other things as well. It's, yeah, it's definitely worthy of exper- of experimenting with. Yep, yep, absolutely. No, that's a really good point that as we, you know, in the sub of them hemisphere, the year gets darker, um, the opportunity to have fire um, around um, grows and and the opportunity to experience fire um, is very useful actually. Um, Gordon White just wrote a, a blog post about fire that I think everyone should read as well because um, you know it wouldn't be an episode if I didn't mention Gordon White. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, you're exactly right. The feeding herbs into it. Um, one of the fascinating things is when when you blindfold a person and you ask them to walk in a straight line, they will naturally walk in a circle, uh, walk in a spiral. (laughs) So you'll tell someone to just walk in a straight line, keep walking, and they will eventually turn around and keep walking in a spiral. Um, It's just the way our minds work. Um, And it's one of those one of those profound symbols that you know it has its own meanings and especially you know the widdish shins and such of you you go in a certain direction it brings you into the underworld you go in a certain direction it's pushing energy out so it's ironic that it's a natural thing to do because it's perfect for trans work yeah absolutely and no one's really going to question you when you're working walking in a spiral like if you go to a big oval and you just go for a walk people just think you're going for a walk you know um, there's actually lots of spirals around. You'd be surprised where they pop up. Um, there's if you're in Melbourne along the Merry Creek bike trail, there's uh, a large spiral, stone spiral that you can walk through. You know, it's all low, low paving stone sort of thing, but um, it is there, and you can just Google it. It comes up on Google Maps, um, and go use that and give it a go. Um, you'll find it in lots of public spaces. There's really subtle spirals. Um, where, you know, some architect or artist has decided that they're going to put a spiral in. Um, So just remember that you can find them everywhere. Mm. And, you know, there's also, I know, like the, uh, you know, it's prevalent through Celtic history as well. It's one of their main symbols. But also people talking about, say, the labyrinth carved into a stone or the spiral carved into a stone, even just tracing it with your finger, I've heard of people sort of using that to sort of induce this, constantly following that pattern with your finger to sort of get into these states. Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a Gemma Gary thing as well um, to do that. So it's always, um, always good to think about how other ways you can find into that spiral as well. Yeah. Um, what would you like to see people do this month with um, Katie's work and Amity and mushrooms? Um, I'd definitely like to hear anyone's experience with any trance work that they do decide to sort of step into. She's also got a, um, a really, really interesting type of almost divination as well where – I'm going to butcher how to say it. I'm just going to say it of how it's actually spelt, which is U-T-I-S-E-T-A. Yeah, so you just set up, which is talking about um, how the Norse used to sort of sit on, say, grave mounds or in where the dead have been buried through the entire night to 
uh, gain prophecy and visions, which I've experienced in the past too. Of it, I found it's quite interesting. So if anyone sort of game to do that, I'd love to sort of hear your experiences with that to sit through a cemetery for the full night and see what comes about. But with the Emanitas as well, like, again, I'm not telling anyone to go out and uh, try these things as they can be potent. It's completely on you. And illegal. And illegal. <laughs> but even just, yeah, trying to connect with it and seeing what comes through. Yeah, definitely. Um, we'd like to hear your experiences of Amanitas in popular culture um, and and what you thought about what we had to say around um, how it's such a prevalent spirit and probably more prevalent than you probably thought it was. Um, and and we'd love to hear about your experiences with any other um, of the fungi, um, what is it, a genus, a species, a kingdom? Uh, yeah, that's... Family. Um, Let's just go with family, the fungi family. <laughs> Yeah, and anyone else that's more curious on Emanita as well, like he's become so popularised, but Hamilton's Pharmacopedia is, he's got a really good um, episode on the Emanita as well. He's definitely um, easy to access and he is quite fascinating. But, yeah, fungus in general are just absolutely fascinate me. So, yeah, I'd love to hear people's thoughts. Yep, absolutely. Um Bru's going to send me the links for those TED Talks and, um, and Pharmacopedia and um, I'll put a list of any books that we've mentioned in the show notes. Um, if you'd like to get in touch, um, stop by the website and leave us a voicemail or send us an email at questions at gardenofinkandbones.com and um, we will see you in a month. <laughs> yep, see you then. See you then. <laughs>